So, what are we aiming for as societies? What does success look like? This question is very, import very important and pertinent, more important than ever before, as, as we've heard James allude to, because of the situation we face in terms of environmental challenges. It's becoming painfully clear that the way our economy treats the planet cannot continue, and that we need to change something quite radically. And at times of change, that's the time when we need to start thinking about what, we really, what, what, what direction we want to go in, what do we really want to go for. So, what does success look like? Well, the usual answer is something a bit like this. More money, an ever-growing economy that just goes round and round. The idea is that if we have more money in a growing economy, then that will mean we can have better lives, we'll have more jobs, social stability, secure pensions, etc., etc. The list goes on. So the idea is that where we want to get to is growth. But if, we're, if that's where we want to go to, then we're more likely to run into a brick wall. This graph helps explain why. So on the, on the um, vertical axis to the left, you've got GDP per capita. The idea being that sort of countries always want to go up that axis, get higher and higher levels of GDP. And on the horizontal axis, you've got ecological footprint, um, the pressure that each country puts on the planet per capita. Obviously, as we move further and further to the right on that, we're causing more and more problems. Now, if we all live like people do in the US, which is somewhere towards the right of there, or indeed many other Western countries, then we'd be needing four, five planets even to sustain us. That's simply not possible. And as countries try harder and harder to move further up that, with more and more economic growth, they end up inevitably shifting, creeping to the right. That's the problem that we face. And technology, some people say, will help us get there. But um, economists such as Tim Jackson and many others have done the maths, and it would require nothing short of a miracle to be able to entirely decouple our environmental impact from GDP growth. Well, luckily, we're not as simple as that. We don't think that GDP growth, more and more money, is all we need in the world. Our intuitive vision of success is a little bit more complex than that. Ever since biblical times, we've understood that uh, being obsessed with material possessions is, is, is not good for us, to put it simply. Um, we understand that there is more to life than money. And that's something that, sort of, that we need to, and we understand that at the individual level. And what we need is to understand that that also applies at societal level. Now, that's beginning to happen. A lot of countries around the world, um, the UK included, have started measuring a broader sense of progress. Um, in a lot of places, it's called well-being. And this sense of progress recognizes that other things other than material possessions are important to us. Health, social relationships, uh, sense of purpose, just to name a few. As we start to measure this, we can start thinking about how policies can be aimed to increase that, even if they don't necessarily increase economic growth. This graph, in this graph, I've replaced GDP per capita with an indicator of well-being called happy life years. This measures people's life expectancy, how long people live in a country, and, and their, uh, uh, combined with their self-reported experience of life. Now, obviously, if you get higher up there, you're talking about having longer, happier lives. And we want to keep on the left-hand side of the axis. Now, there is a relationship between happy life years and ecological footprint, but it's not nearly as constrained as the one we saw in the previous graph. You can move to the top left of this graph. You can have higher life year, happy life years for a lower ecological footprint. The question is, how do we do it? And in the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to give you a picture of three big picture solutions that are win-win solutions that will increase our well-being and reduce our environmental impact. A manifesto for sustainable well-being for all. In the 1930s, the British economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that by around now, we'd all be working about 15 hours a week. He thought that as we invented technologies and machines to make us more productive and make us more efficient at work, we would work less. If you could do a day's work in three hours, that's what we would do. And then you'd take the rest of the day for leisure. He wasn't completely wrong, of course. Um, we did invent lots of machines that can do our work for us. One only needs to go to the supermarket and see the self-service checkouts to see that in action. But the result hasn't necessarily mean, meant that we've worked less. So we've carried on working just as much, and we've just produced more. In the UK, one in five people are overworked, working more than 45 hours a week. These people have lower levels of happiness and higher levels of anxiety. Some of you might be amongst them. I know I am sometimes. <laughs> Um, and, at the and at the same time, one in two, ten people are underworked, either unemployed entirely or working part-time and voluntarily. This seems like we've missed the point. La technology was supposed to free us from, from labor, but actually what's happened is some of us are still working just as hard, whilst others have been ejected into unemployment. 
Something's not quite right here. Um, now, and some of those people who've been injected into unemployment are probably the people who used to work in the airport, in the um, supermarket checkouts that are no longer needed, or the people in the airport check-ins that are no longer needed, or any of the other industries which have been more and more automized. Computers, machines have replaced us, but they've actually meant that we've been thrust into unemployment rather than into leisure time. We believe that if you reduce working time across the board, but particularly longer working hours, we will see an improvement in well-being across the board and reduce levels of unemployment. Reduce, we'd be able to redistribute work. We'd also be able to see lots of other good things. For example, reductions in gender inequality as men have more time to put into childcare. More time will be able to be spent into civic participation, civil participation. And we'll be able to live slower. Be able to, for example, cook instead of buying ready-made meals. Repair and make things rather than buying them ready off the shelves. And, and simply have more meaningful leisure activities rather than returning home at the end of the day exhausted and slumping in front of the television. Now, all these kinds of shifts, ah, it's important to mention. Some people might be concerned that if, if we work less, then we'll produce less of the things that are important to our well-being. There'd be less of the things that we really matter to us. But I'm not sure if that's entirely true. One in four people in the UK say that they don't believe that what they do at their job is worthwhile. Some of those people might be right. Perhaps some of the people who make and sell clothes that just sit in the back of wardrobes unused with the tag still on, or make and sell smartphones to replace smartphones from the previous year, which are just about the same. Maybe they aren't contributing that much to the economy. Maybe the people who, who spend their lives persuading us to buy one smartphone as, to, as opposed to another, or one item of clothing as opposed to another, aren't contributing that much to well-being. But they are contributing to our environmental impact. Reducing working hours is about trimming that fluff economy so that we can live well within environmental limits. Now, what can we do to achieve that? There's many things that we can talk about. For example, um, businesses could be having more incentives from the tax system to hire people part-time as opposed to full-time. People need to be able to feel free to ask for part-time work while the, um, rather than full-time without being concerned that they might lose their job as a result. And we need restrictions at the top end so that people aren't allowed to work ridiculous hours, as indeed that is the case in most of Europe. And of course, we do need some shifts in thinking as well. And that brings me to the next thing. Because, of course, a lot of people work long hours because they believe that that will, that will give them the money they want to, to pursue more and more consumption. For example, having a few more watches in their collection. This belief that more and more money is, is what we want in life is called materialism. And it's grown. In the 1970s, this is, a, this is based on data from the USA, students in the USA when they enter college, um, two out of five people believed that it was very important to be very well off financially. By the 1980s, that had increased to four out of five. Meaning, meanwhile, just for contrast, the proportion of those people who felt that it was important to develop a meaningful philosophy of life decreased from four, in, four out of five to two out of five. Now, psychologists know that this increasing materialism is bad for us in many ways. It, it's, it's bad for our well-being. It increases levels of depression. It leads to more addictions, less pro-social behavior, for example, volunteering, and people caring less about the environment. And there have been all sorts of exciting experiments which have demonstrated this. What can we do about it? Now, actually, in a lot of countries, there are some movements towards trying to tackle materialism. Um, for example, in Sweden, Norway, and Quebec, there are bans against advertising to children. In Montpellier, in France, and Sao Paulo, in Brazil, there are no, there are no um, advertising in public places. Aside from that, there are other things we can think about. For example, um, if we had a stronger social security net, then people would be less concerned, less worried about the future, and less feel the need to hoard money for a rainy day. If we had more time, as I discussed previously, we'd be able to devote more of our time to leisure activities which give us meaning. And, and I think this will bring me on to the next thing, we need to think about the distribution of wealth. Because as long as there are people who are earning a lot more than us and consuming a lot more, we'll always be looking at them and thinking, maybe that life's a little bit better. So we do need a fairer economy. We've all heard the data recently. 85, the 85 richest people in the world have as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. That's 85 people having as much wealth as around three and a half billion people. As well as this being just woefully unjust, it's woefully wasteful. In economic terms, anyone who studied economics will have learned the term of diminishing returns. The idea that, as, uh, that 10 pounds for the average Joe is worth a lot more than 10 pounds for a billionaire. And yet, our economy continues to give the 10 pounds to the billionaire. 
Wellbeing has confirmed this, this, this pattern. We know from wellbeing data that as you move up the income distribution, the in increases in wellbeing de begin to diminish, they begin to decline, such that as you get higher and higher up there, it doesn't really make much difference whether you have um, 80,000 pounds a year, sorry, 50,000 pounds a year, or 100,000 or 200,000 pounds. Now, this kind of inequality is, is, is down to all sorts of reasons. Now, one thing we can start, start thinking about is about the tax system, and that's a sort of fairly easy place to start. You might be surprised to hear this, but actually in the UK we have a regressive tax system. People on lower incomes pay more, a greater proportion of their income than people on the richer incomes. Of course, I'm not talking just about income tax here, I'm talking about sales taxes such as VAT and the fact that our capital taxes are very low. So let's start from that. Let's have a tax system which actually is progressive rather than regressive. But we need to go a little bit further than that. Does it really make sense that a CEO has, uh, can have a salary of $200,000 an hour? Does it really make sense that we believe, do we really believe that he works as hard in one hour or produces as much good for society in one hour as a nurse does, for example, in four years? I think we all recognize that there are differences in what businesses, what different uh, uh, people contribute in their, in their job, but such an extreme ratio is ridiculous. Many companies already talk about pay ratios. Many companies already have pay ratios where the CEO can only earn a certain amount more than people, than the lowest paid members of staff, such as the cleaners. This could be the norm. Wealth inequality is even more absurd. The economist Thomas Piketty has explained how and has warned us that we're returning to a Victorian age where you can make more money by just sitting idly on, a, on capital, on, on, on property, and waiting for rents to come in than if you actually did any work. We need, to think about, we need to think about property. Property is a big part of this, of course. We need to think about property in a different way. Property isn't an investment, isn't a way to make money. It should be a place to live. And we can, do, we, can, we can think about laws which will help us achieve that. At the moment, in many cities in the UK and beyond, there's a housing crisis where people don't have places they can live and they can afford to live in that are near to places where they can work. Regulations about what we do about property will help tackle the housing crisis and will also reduce wealth inequality. So, long working hours, materialism, inequality. The three problems are linked. Um, and we've seen some different ideas about how we can tackle each of them, whether they're directives at the EU level or, 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 or rules or, or, or bans on advertising in different places such as Sao Paulo in Sweden, or pay ratios that are taking place in companies, many major companies that are already recognizing that inequality in wealth is, 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 not, is not what they want to aim for. We need to bring these things together. Today, I think we're going to hear a lot of amazing stories at the individual level about people who are pioneers and changing their lifestyles to achieve sustainable well-being. These are all great because they show us what we can do. But we also need to bear in mind that we, need, that we all need to be doing this. This needs to be for society as a whole, not just those who are brave enough to try it. And for that to happen, political leaders need to also recognize that this better vision is possible and that we can live good lives without destroying the planet. Our job is to show them that it is possible. Thank you.